Welcome back. And now we will begin lecture two. And lecture two, I will be sharing the times of the word explained through the holy feasts. The main passage comes from Leviticus chapter 23, but we will read in portions verses 1 through 11 and 15 through 17 and 24 through 28. The reason why we are studying about the feasts as a second lecture uh, is because of the theme, declaring the end from the beginning. We talked about and we learned about Genesis chapter 1 creation story about how that relates to Jesus and about the end time. And now we're going to think a little bit about uh, what God has done in his work of redemption and salvation of his people from Israel, uh, from Egypt, uh, in Exodus and Leviticus. And while he was doing that, he gave us a frame of time. And uh, this time uh, and activities, co convocation and uh, the things that the Israelites were supposed to do on these days. So time, task, mission, and purpose that are contained in these feasts. So we are going to think about that today. But let us read the main passage first. Leviticus 23, verses 1 through 11. The Lord spoke again to Moses, saying, Speak to the sons of Israel and say to them, The Lord's appointed times which you shall proclaim as holy convocations, my appointed times are these. For six days work may be done. But on the seventh day, there is a Sabbath of complete rest, a holy convocation. You shall not do any work. It is a Sabbath to the Lord in all your dwellings. These are the appointed times of the Lord, holy convocations, which you shall proclaim at the times appointed for them. In the first month, the 14th day of the month, at twilight is the Lord's Passover. Then on the 15th day of the same month, there is the feast of unleavened bread to the Lord, for seven days you shall eat unleavened bread. On the first day you shall have a holy convocation. You shall not do any laborious work. For, but for seven days you shall present an offering by fire to the Lord. On the seventh day is a holy convocation. You shall not do any laborious work. Then the Lord spoke to Moses saying, Speak to the sons of Israel and say to them, When you enter the land which I am going to give to you and reap its harvest, then you shall bring in the sheaf of the first fruits of your harvest to the priest. He shall wave the sheaf before the Lord for you to be accepted. On the day after the Sabbath, the priest shall wave it. And then uh, we'll skip to verse 17, uh, verses 15 through 17. You shall also count for yourselves from the day after the Sabbath, from, which, from the day when you brought in the sheaf of the wave offering, there shall be seven complete Sabbaths. You shall count 50 days to the day after the seventh Sabbath. Then you shall present a new grain offering to the Lord. You shall bring in from your dwelling places two loaves of bread for a wave offering made of two tenths of an ephah. They shall be of fine flour baked with leaven as first fruits to the Lord. And then verses 24 through 28, speak to the sons of Israel saying, in the seventh month on the first of the month, you shall have a rest, a, remem a reminder by blowing of trumpets, a holy convocation. You shall not do any laborious work, but you shall present an offering by fire to the Lord. The Lord spoke to Moses saying, on, exact on exactly the 10th day of this seventh month is the day of atonement. It shall be a holy convocation for you, and you shall humble your souls and present an offering by fire to the Lord. You shall not do any work on this same day, for it is a day of atonement, to make atonement on your behalf before the Lord your God. This is the word of God. And so this, these passages speak about three different seasons of feasts. And the first season included the Passover and the unleavened bread, Feast of Unleavened Bread, and, and also the uh, Feast of the First Fruits. And then the second season uh, contain, uh, speaks about this second passage that we read, uh, verses 15 through 17, speaks about the Feast of the Harvest, and also known as Pentecost. And this last passage that we read speaks about the Day of the Trumpets, and also uh, on the 
10th is the Day of Atonement. And then uh, we didn't read it, but after this comes the Feast of Booths, also known as Feast of Tabernacles. So let us think about these three feast seasons. But first, we need to understand two main terms that were repeated over and over again through the passages that we just read. The first word is convocation, and second word is appointed time. So in Hebrew, convocation is mikra. God continues to tell them, you shall have this convocation. And he continues to repeat the importance of people gathering and people being called for this purpose. And this convocation, mikra, or assembly, it's not just a gathering, it's not just a, a meeting or assembly or, or Bible study or have worship service, but it, it has a very important significance. And according to the Hebrew understanding, according to the uh, Jewish understanding, these were rehearsal or prophetic shadow of the steps that sinful man must take in order to come and be reconciled to Yahweh, our God. And so this, from this word mikra, we can understand that this convocation has a purpose of redemption, has a purpose of reconciliation. And so God is calling them for a purpose on these appointed days and times. They are God's plan for man's salvation or redemption, rolled up into seven easy to understand steps with messages of redemption, sanctification, salvation, atonement, and glorification. Not necessarily in that order. So these are gatherings for the purpose of redemption, purpose of, uh, it is God calling his people back to his presence. So when God tells his people in the Old Testament and the New Testament, but especially in the Old Testament, when God tells his people to remember something, and he repeatedly tells them, remember this day, remember this day, and observe something, there's a reason. Especially when God turns it into a rule or regulation and makes his people remember religiously, ceremonially, year by year, every year, to remember and keep it it means, and it has a, a significance, that it has something to do with the coming of the Messiah. God is making them practice over and over and over again with a message, hoping that they would come to understand something that God has hidden in that practice, in that day, in all the pa Bible passages that they were to read in, on those days. So it... We can find uh, mysteries about the first coming and about the second coming, about Jesus and about the end time in these appointed days and convocations. So Mikra, these convocations, Mikra serves four purposes. First, to remember God's saving work in Egypt and wilderness. So these days were uh, set up and God told the Israelites to remember. And that's why on these days, uh, according to the Jewish practice, uh, festivals, they gather and the uh, sages or the elders or, or fathers or grandparents, they teach their children about what the Lord has done to continue to remember God's work of salvation through the Passover and through the wilderness and in the Egypt. And please uh, forgive us for if you can hear this drilling sound, uh, we cannot stop it, it's, it's happening downstairs. And uh, please, uh, I, we, I'd like to ask you for your understanding. But uh, God wants us to remember, and that's, the, that's one of the uh, main themes of the History of Redemption series and of the Bible. God tells his people to remember. Remember the days of old. And even in today's uh, main theme, uh, Isaiah chapter 46, verses 9 through 11, uh, remember the days of old, the ages of old, because that's when God uh, declared the, begin the end, from the beginning to the end, 
And also, remember means remember what God has done in the history. Remember God, what God has done in your life so that we can understand how God does his work. And, so, and when we remember God's saving work, we can give thanks to him and praise him. Secondly, it's, uh, Mikra serves as a reminder for people to give thanks to God in times of harvest. These Mikra's convocations are closely related to harvest times. And so these are times when they can come before the Lord with offering and thanksgiving. Remembering and f- looking forward to the eternal harvest of redemption work. And Mikra's are concentrated during harvest seasons. Third, as prophecy of Messiah's work. These have time markers and significances that, ref- that foreshadow and prophesy about what the Messiah will be doing. What will he be doing? Redemption work, salvation work. These are the days when they remember God's redemption work in Egypt, from Egypt, and as a result, that prophesies what Jesus will do, not only saving us from Egypt, from, but from the world of the bondages of sin. And lastly, to outline the times in redemptive history, not only about the Old Testament times, not only about the times of Jesus' first coming, but also about the end time, when the final harvest will take place. And the second word that we need to focus on and understand is moed. In plural form, it's moedim. Moed is the appointed time, designated days. All the holy feasts of God are called moed, meaning that they are God's appointed times. These are the important times when God said, let us meet together. We do something together on these days. These are important days. I believe these are more important than your birthdays, your uh, any special anniversaries. These are the days when we are to meet with God. In Genesis chapter 1, verse 14, we see the first appearance of this Hebrew word moed. When then God said, let there be lights in the expanse of the heavens to separate the day from the night. And let them be for signs and for seasons and for days and years. It says for seasons. Seasons are uh, days or times that are distinguished from other times. And so seasons are times with beginning and end. Okay? God's creation work and redeeming work both take place in the physical world, which means that he works within the realm of time and space. Although God is not limited by time and space, for the sake of our salvation, he comes into his work, he works within our time and space so that we can be redeemed, so that he can bring us into the world that is not limited by time and space. So God introduces this concept of time first in Genesis chapter 1, verse 1. That is the beginning of time. And in Revelation chapter 1, God says, Jesus says, I am the Alpha and the Omega. He sets the beginning and the end. And Moed means a set time that has the beginning and the end. Genesis chapter 1, verse 1, it says, In the beginning God created the heavens and the earth. This beginning is already a beginning of God's certain work of creation and salvation on this earth. In John chapter 1, verse 1, in the beginning was the word. That beginning is RK, meaning referring to endless time. There is no beginning. It's, it's before the beginning. He's the origin of the beginning. But this here... In the beginning, God created in Bereshit. It means a beginning point in time. Whereas RK in Greek, in John chapter 1, verse 1, is a cause of the beginning. So here, Moed contains God's administration of redemption. God, the beginning of God's work of redemption. It's God's schedule for his redemptive work. So appointed times are very important 
in understanding the history of redemption for us. So let us look at these three harvest seasons. You might not be able to see all the little words here, but I will um, enlarge them for you in a little bit. But here we see the harvest seasons first, the harvest seasons. And uh, we have some scholars divided into two seasons, uh, the spring season and autumn season, uh, and uh, kind of combine the early harvest season and mid-harvest season as uh, spring harvest season and then light, late harvest season as the autumn. But because Leviticus 23 divides it into three sections, uh, we understand it as early harvest, mid-harvest, or middle harvest, and late final harvest season. And the early harvest includes the Passover, Feast of Unleavened Bread, and the Feast of the First Fruits. And the mid-harvest, Feast of Weeks, also known as the Pentecost or the Feast of Harvest. And then the late last final harvest includes the Feast of the Trumpets and the Day of Atonement, the Feast of the Tabernacles or Feast of Booths. So we're going to think about one by one. First, the early harvest. So the early harvest, again, Passover, the Feast of Unleavened Bread, and the Feast of the First Fruits. When did they take place? Passover, the Passover was the 14th day of Nisan. And so they were to bring in, take a lamb, one-year-old lamb, on the 10th of Nisan and uh, look through, investigate, and uh, see if it has any blame for, f for four days. And on the 14th day, they are to kill the lamb and eat the lamb and put the, the, door, uh, the bl blood on the doorpost and lentil. And then from the 15th to the 21st is the seven days when they are to eat unleavened bread. So right after the, the Passover, regardless of which day, which day of the week it falls on, it is considered Sabbath. And, then, uh, and, and that is the beginning of the unleavened bread, Feast of Unleavened Bread. And after that, they have the Feast of the First Fruits. They give the wave offering. And what happened? Old Testament and New Testament. In the Old Testament, Exodus chapter 12, verses 1 through 20, what happened? Exodus. The Exodus happened. On the 14th, they killed the lamb, and it was called the Passover because the angel of death passed over the houses that had the blood of the lamb. When the angel of death killed the firstborns of all of Egypt. And so it was the day of salvation for the Israelites day of salvation for those who had the lamb, blood of the lamb, but it was at the same time day of judgment for those who did not have the blood of the lamb. And as a result, the Israelites were freed from this bondage and slavery in Egypt. They came out into the wilderness and they started to walk in the wilderness. In the New Testament, during this Passion Week before Jesus died on the cross. And that day, when Jesus died on the cross, remember when Jesus started his ministry, John the Baptist in John chapter 1, verse 29 said, Behold, a lamb that takes away the sin of the world. Right? He is referring, this is the Passover language. He is referring, Jesus, referring to Jesus as the Passover lamb that dies, that carries all of our sins. The atonement lamb. And so Jesus, during this Passion Week, just as the lamb was investigated and looked through and questioned, not questioned, but uh, looked through uh, to see if there's any blame, Jesus was investigated, interrogated, questioned, during this time, before he was killed, just like the lamb was tested. And the lamb was killed only if it was blameless, ironically. And Jesus, because he was blameless, 
because he was sinless, he died, he was killed on the cross. He was crucified. And as a result of the death of this lamb, the Israelites, the household that had that blood of the lamb was freed from the bondages of Egypt. Likewise, the one who believes and who holds on to the blood of Jesus who died is freed from the bondages of this world and of sin. So Jesus is questioned, tried, and crucified during this Passion Week, which, is, which was the Passover. And what did Jesus do on these days? During Jesus' ministry, three-year ministry, and I'm going to depend on the Gospel of John to uh, give us the timeline. And uh, we, are, um, we are looking at the, uh, what Jesus did on these days before the crucifixion, during his ministry. And so he came and cleansed the temple. Let us look at John chapter 2, verse 13. It says, The Passover of the Jews was near, and Jesus went up to Jerusalem, and he found in the temple those who were selling oxen and sheep and doves and the money changers seated at their tables. And this is when, uh, in verse 15, and he made a scourge of cords and drove them all out of the temple with the sheep and the oxen, and he poured out the coins of the money changers and overturned their tables. So we know this story about Jesus' cleansing of the temple. And this, uh, interestingly, according to the practice of the Jews in the Old Testament times, after this, the first Passover from Egypt, what they needed to do was to clean out their houses of the leaven. Because uh, right after the Passover begins the Feast of the Unleavened Bread, they're not supposed to have any leaven yeast in the house. And sometimes the, this leaven is in the air too. So what they needed to do was to clean out everything in the house, make sure that there's no leaven in the house. And that became uh, uh, the root, uh, historical root for spring cleaning. They did the spring cleaning right before this Passover or during this Passover season. And so Jesus comes to his house, which is the temple, and he does this cleaning work. That's one of the things that he did on the Passover days. And we are only thinking about one thing. Um, not all the, uh, the Passovers were recorded in the Gospels. Secondly, uh, the mid-harvest, Feast of Weeks, or Pentecost, Feast of the Harvest. It's 50th day from the first day after the Sabbath, which is... Uh, I mentioned that after the Passover, the first day after that is considered Sabbath, regardless of which day it falls on. And so after that, that day, the first day is Nisan 16th. And so counting from that day, 50th day. And this is written in Leviticus chapter 23, verses 15 through 16. Shall we read it? You shall also count for yourselves from the day after the Sabbath, from the day when you brought in the sheaf of the wave offering. There shall be seven complete Sabbaths. You shall count 50 to the day after, seventh, after the seventh Sabbath. Then you shall present a new grain offering to the Lord. And so this is the Feast of the Harvest. And now, from the 16th day, so the 16th day will be the first day of the 50 days. And so, oops. the uh, 50th day from Nisan 16th. And what happened in the Old Testament if, uh, during the Exodus and wilderness journey, that is when God spoke the Ten Commandments to his people. It's the day when they heard the voice of God. When the Israelites were at, uh, camped at the wilderness of Sinai, Moses went up and down Mount Sinai. How many times? This is in the seventh book in the History of Redemption series. This is eternal covenant for all generations, the Ten Commandments. And Reverend Abraham Park, uh, this is something that I really, really 
was shocked when I first learned because I disagreed when I first heard about this. The fact that Moses went up and down Mount Sinai eight different times. And I said, no way, maybe maximum three. I used to think two, twice. I thought I knew the Bible. Uh, but read from, if, you, if you're curious, uh, read from Exodus chapter 19 all the way. Uh, and count and try to uh, read carefully and try to find verses that says Moses came to God and Moses went away from God or, or came down from the mountain, went up. It doesn't always say went up to the mountain or went, came down from the mountain, but he came to the people and he came to the Lord. And so, and there, the Lord makes sure to tell Moses, do not let the people come up the mountain. And the Lord tells Moses, you come up to the mountain to speak to me, to him, to God, right? So when he is speaking to God, you might think maybe he prayed from the bottom of the mountain. No, it, here the Lord specifically instructed Moses to come up to the mountain and meet with him and talk to him. So when Moses is speaking to God, he's up at the mountain. When he's speaking to the people, he's down at the mountain. They did not have cell phones. Even now, I don't think cell phones work up uh, from the top of the mountain, Mount Sinai. And, and so he had to go up and down, and it's shocking and very uh, revealing of how ignorant I was when I read through this passage. And anyway, uh, this was the fourth ascent of Moses when uh, God spoke in his voice to the people of, people of God, to the Israelites, the Ten Commandments. And the Israelites were trembling in fear when he, they heard the voice of God. They said, God, that is enough. Please speak to Moses so that he can speak to us. So re the rest of the, the law, and uh, in the book of the law, God, Moses went up and received it from God, and then he came down and recited and wrote it down. Okay? And then later, at the sixth ascent, God gives the two tables, the, the tablets of the Ten Commandments. Fourth ascent, God speaks the word, speaks the, the Ten Commandments. Sixth ascent, God gives the two tablets and the pattern or instructions of, for the tabernacle. Okay? And then uh, the two tablets are shattered because the people were worshiping the golden calf. And so through the repentance of the seventh ascent and, and descent, and, and the, on the eighth ascent, God writes with his fingers on the tablets that he instructed Moses to make and bring up. Okay? So uh, during this fourth ascent, we will take a look at this a bit later, but this was the Pentecost. This was the 50th day from the 16th of Nisan. In the New Testament, that is exactly the day of the Pentecost. And this Pentecost was already practiced. Uh, this day was already set in the Old Testament. And interestingly, on that exact same day is the, when, is the day when the Holy Spirit came down. And they spoke with, it's the day of the blessing of the years, blessing of speaking in tongues. But a lot of the scholars say it's a day of the blessing of the years because they understood the different languages, different tongues. The original Pentecost, this Feast of Weeks, they heard the voice of God. It's the blessing of the years. Right? And in the New Testament, they, they received the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit came down. The original Feast of Weeks, God came down. Okay. So it's the day when they received the word, received the, the Ten Commandments. What did Jesus do? Uh, in John chapter 5, verse 1 and the following, it says it was the Feast 
or festival of the Jews. It doesn't specify exactly which feast, but we can presume and we can guesstimate that it was the day of the harvest, feast of the harvest, Pentecost, and Jesus healed the man who was sick for 38 years. Remember the man who was sick for 38 years? He was waiting at the uh, Bethesda, and he was waiting for the, the angel to come down and the movement of the, the waters, and the first one who jumps into that pond would be healed of any sickness they, they might have. But this man who was sick for 38 years could not go in, right? It was the day when they were waiting for the spirit, the angel to come down from heaven. But Jesus walked to him, and he said, do you want to be healed? Do you want to get well? And so he received that, that blessing of healing. And the final harvest, Feast of the Trumpets, the Day of Atonement, and Feast of Tabernacles or Booths. And these, the Feast of the Trumpets is also known as Rosh Hashanah, the, the Day of the Head, right? Uh, the, the beginning. And because Tishri month was the beginning of their civil calendar, the beginning, they considered the, that was the beginning of the year. Um, and so the first day of the first month, although the, uh, in order it was the seventh month, because in G Exodus chapter 12, God, gives the, God resets the calendar and says, this is the beginning of the year for you. And that was the, year, uh, the month of Nisan or Abib, which was the first month. And therefore, this becomes, Tishri becomes the, f the seventh month. But according to their farming, farming schedule, farming itinerary, and according to their tradition, uh, Tishri was known as the first beginning. And so that is the Rosh Hashanah, Feast of Trumpets, also known as Yom Teruah. And this is the day when the trumpets are blown to let people know this is the beginning. The old has passed and the new has come. And then on the 10th of that beginning is the day of atonement. All the old sins are washed and cleansed and forgiven. And it prepares the people of God for the new day, new year, new beginning. And then from the 15th to the 21st are seven days when they go out into the wilderness or nowadays they do this in the backyard or uh, uh, in the neighborhood. They pitch a tent and they have this ceremony. Uh, and they used to do that near the, uh, around the temple or at the temple, come to the temple all seven days and have this joyous, joyous ceremony remembering the blessings of God in the wilderness, and also looking forward to the eternal tabernacle, eternal tentage or dwelling where they can dwell with God. And I said Tishri 1 to 22 because seven days from the 15th to the 21st are the Feast of Booths. But the Israelites used to uh, consider the eighth day, the great day when they receive the blessing. So, uh, so on this day, on, the, on, on this feast, they would, uh, this is the beginning of their farming year. And so they would pray to God because the difference between the land of Egypt and the land of Canaan, God explained in Deuteronomy, I believe chapter 11, from verse 10. For the land into which you are entering to possess it is not like the land of Egypt from which you came, where you used to sow your seed and water it with your foot like a vegetable garden. But the land into which you are about to cross, uh, about to, cross to possess it, a land of hills and valleys, drinks water from the rain of heaven. The land for which the Lord your God cares 
The eyes of the Lord your God are always on it from the beginning to the end of the year. So the difference is the land of Egypt, they used to tread mill to irrigate the water from the Nile River. And that's why they worship the Nile River as a god because it provides their livelihood. It's human effort, human work. But in the land of Canaan, it is a land that God cares. From the beginning to the end of the year, it is God who provides the water. And so what, they, what do they need to do? Not tread the mill, they need to pray to God. So in the beginning of their farming year, which is Tishri, during the Feast of the Tabernacle, they would gather in the temple and read about uh, and recite and teach the, the Levites and the priests would teach the people about what, how God provided water. And they read Jeremiah, they read uh, different passages in the Bible. And they pray. They have ceremonies of drink offering. They go down to the the pool of Siloam and bring water and they have, they have uh, these willow uh, branches and different things to uh, pray to God for blessing of rain. And on the eighth day of this, fe this feast, after the seven days, if the eighth day is known as the great day. Uh, let us read it in the Bible. John chapter 7. It says, Jesus teaches at the feast. After these things, Jesus was walking in Galilee, right? for he was unwilling to walk in Judea because the Jews were seeking to kill him. Now the feast of the Jews, the feast of booths was near. Okay. And verse 37, it says, now on the last day, the great day of the feast. And they believe that if on this great day, on the eighth day, God actually sends down rain. That is a sign of great blessing for the rest of the year. But on this day, Jesus comes to the, temp to the temple. Remember it said Jesus was not willing, was unwilling to go up to Jerusalem. But he comes up hiding in secret. And then he stands up and he teaches in the temple. And he, this teaching is very revealing of who Jesus is. And later he continues on this teaching in chapter 8. And even says, unless you believe that I am he, referring to God the Father in heaven, you will die in your sins. Right? But on this day, Jesus comes to the temple and he says, if anyone is thirsty, let him come to me and drink. He who believes in me, as the scriptures said, from his innermost being will flow rivers of living water. What's he speaking about? This is a day when they remember how God provides water. This is a day when they give thanks to God for giving water and ask God for continuous blessing of water. And Jesus says, I am the one. I am the source of this living water. If you need water, come to me and you will have abundance of, of, of water flowing. And verse 39, but this he spoke of the spirit whom those who believed in him were to receive, for the Spirit was not yet given, because Jesus was not yet glorified. So this is the day when Jesus claimed that he is the source of the living waters. But in the Old Testament, Moses' final descent from Mount Sinai took place on this day. So Exodus and then receiving of the word, of the law, and then the final descent. The Passover, salvation, through the blood of Jesus Christ, receiving of the Holy Spirit, where we can think about our life of faith, receiving of the Holy Spirit, receiving of the word, and then final blessing or judgment. Because throughout the Bible, we see at the end, the f Garden of Eden was the place of God that, that flowed with water of life. In Ezekiel's temple, from the center of the temple, flowed out the water of life, giving life. And in 
the New Jerusalem, we see from the, from the throne, from under the throne of God, comes the water of life, giving fruit to the trees of life on both sides of the river. So in the end, we have to receive this water on the, uh, and that is given on the feast of the tabernacle. And so in the New Testament, it's the hope of the final harvest and eternal atonement. The first holy feasts observed, the feasts were instituted during the Exodus and wilderness journey. It was God's providence to lead the Israelites through the Exodus and the wilderness journey for the following reasons. Here, uh, God speaks to Pharaoh through Moses about the reason why he is taking them out of Egypt to the wilderness. He says in Exodus chapter 3, verse 12, to worship, Abad. Again, uh, in Genesis, the reason why God put and the, the task that was given to Adam in the Garden of Eden was Abad and Shamar, to cultivate and keep. That word cultivate in Genesis chapter 2, verse 15 and the following, is Abad, to worship, to serve the Lord. Secondly, it is to sacrifice. Zabach, to the Lord our God. And third, it is to celebrate a feast, Hagag. So these feasts were very important in the Exodus and the wilderness journey. So let us take a look at this uh, calendar that is in this book, in the seventh book in the History of Redemption series. And I believe the sixth book will come out soon. And the seventh book, uh, I'm talking about the English version, will come out uh, soon after the sixth book. And here uh, in this book is the uh, the calendar of the Exodus and the wilderness journey all the way to the, the eight ascents of Mount Sinai that, of Moses. Uh, and so this is the calendar that you can see. And uh, please be, uh, try not to be so confused because it has the Korean, English, Hebrew, and Japanese there. But uh, you can read any, uh, any language from there that you are familiar with, but you can see that this is a calendar, Sunday, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, right? And this is the first month, Nisan, okay? And on the 14th of Nisan is the Passover, okay? And that's when they kill the lamb. And on the 15th, they departed from Ramses, and it's the Exodus. It's the beginning of the Feast of Unleavened Bread. Okay. But on the 10th is when they took the Passover lamb. It is the 14th when they killed the Passover lamb. Okay. And then, so... We can see here, this is 11, 12, 13, 14, and then uh, 17, 18, 19, 20, 21. And these are the campsites. Second campsite was Etham. Third campsite was before Migdol. And after Migdol, they crossed the Red Sea. And take a look at when they crossed the Red Sea. And these are... Uh, some of the dates may be estimated because, uh, through the distance, but there are clues given in Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy that allowed the author to figure out this exact calendar and itinerary of when they arrived at these campsites, especially when uh, they arrived at the wilderness of Sin, where manna started to fall, right? When they arrived at the wilderness of sin, according to Exodus chapter 16, they started to complain about food. And God responded to them saying, from the morning, which is next morning, there will be manna. 
And so that next morning, manna is given. And God says, God instructs them, for five days, you shall gather one, one per portion, right? One for one person. But on the sixth day, you can gather twice as much because the seventh day, you will not be gathering. So that already tells us this is God's way of training them to keep the Sabbath because up until then, in Egypt, they forgot about, they lost track of which, when the Sabbath days were. But here, God gives the manna, and from that day begins the six days of gathering and the seventh day. And so the seventh day is Saturday, which is the Sabbath day. And so that this Sunday, is, which is on the sixth, 16th of the second month, the month of Yar, was when manna started to be given. And for five days, they gathered. And sixth day, they gathered, which is Friday, they gathered twice. And the seventh day was the Sabbath day. And so this is a clue of uh, how he found these days of the week applied to this calendar. And look at on the 21st of the first month, they crossed the Red Sea. This is the, this is the end. They crossed the Red Sea. This is the end of the feast, the last day of the feast of un, un, uh, unleavened bread. And then, We'll go all the way to the 50th day. 50th day after the Exodus, okay, which is the third day, uh, third day, the sixth day of the third month. It's the sixth day of the third month. With the third month is called the month of Siwan or Sivan. And this is when the Ten Commandments and the laws were proclaimed by the Lord. Okay. So, and it tells us the first ascent, second ascent, third ascent, fourth ascent, fifth ascent, and so on. And then, this seven, so this 50th day was the Pentecost. When, he, when the Lord proclaimed and declared the Ten Commandments. And then the, fee, the Day of Atonement was the day uh, when Moses finally descend, came down from Mount Sinai, and that was the eighth descent. Now, as conclusion, let us think about the times of the Word. In, uh, now that we have... Uh, spent quite a bit of time studying about the feasts. Let us think about the times of the word. The holy feasts, feasts are times of fruit and harvest. And I, as we read, it's the time, the, the fruit and harvest requires God's blessing of rain. And Deuteronomy 32 verses 1 and 2, it says, Give ear, O heavens, and let me speak, and let the earth hear the words of my mouth, let my teaching drop as the rain, my speech distill as the dew, as the droplets of, on the fresh grass and as the showers on the herb. So rain or dew signify the words of God, the words of my mouth, he says. It's the time when God's word comes down and bears fruit and harvest. So it's the time, it's, it's closely related to the times when God's, God sends down rain. And that rain represents the word of God. So let us think about the times when the word of God was given to us. When the word of God came down to us. And that results in fruition and harvest, spiritual harvest. And so these three seasons of the feasts, foreshadow the spiritual harvest times as, that comes as a result of God's word given to us. So let us think about the times when the word of God was given to us. 
throughout the Bible. Psalm 33, verses 6 through 9, By the word of the Lord, heavens were made, and by the breath of his mouth, all their host. He gathers the waters of the sea together as a heap. He lays up the deeps in storehouses. Let all the earth fear the Lord. Let all the inhabitants of the world stand in awe of him. For he spoke, and it was done. He commanded, and it stood fast. So, when the word comes down, there's the work of creation. So seeing the, seeing the effect, we can see that there was a presence of the word, such as the creation in Genesis chapter 1. Hebrews chapter 11, verse 3, By faith we understand that the worlds were prepared by the word of God, so that what is seen was not made out of things which were visible. So what, when did the word come down? Genesis chapter 1. It was the word. John chapter 1 verse 1 through 4 tells us it is the word that created all heavens and the earth and all things in it. Right? So as a result of that creation, at the end of that creation, the word was at the Garden of Eden. The word was given to Adam and Eve. Secondly, at Mount Sinai, as we have just read and, and seen, God's, God gave the word, Decalogue, the ten words, which represent the entire fullness of God's word okay, to Moses and the people of Israel. Third, of course, there are other places, but we are to only looking at the main uh, significant big e e events and, and times when the word was given or word came down. Jesus is the Logos. He's the word that came down. And lastly, in Revelation, the word is given through another strong angel to John, the apostle, in the form of the little book. Of course, uh, you know, Isaiah, Ezekiel, we can see the word is, is being given. The scroll is given, right? But here in Revelation, the little book. What happened when the word came down? What happened as a result? First, the people who received the word met God or the angel who represented God. The, and, and scholars call it theophany, when God actually appeared to his people. There are times when uh, it seems like God came down. It, it says that God came down and God met his people. Abraham met God. Abraham met also Melchizedek. And Jacob, when he wrestled with a man, he realized that he was an angel. And then later he said, I saw the face of God at Peniel, right, at River Jabbok. And so, uh, theophany. But when the word is given, the one who received the word met God. So, since this is part of conclusion, I pray that you and I, may be the ones that will receive that rain from heaven. And may that feast, the festival, appointed time. See, appointed time is like Kairos time, God's appointed time. And that time is not according to Kronos time, which, is, which can be calculated by hours and minutes and, and days and weeks and months. But it is like Galatians chapter 4, verse 4, when time came, at the right time, Jesus came. It is when the will of God and the faith of men all come together, and it's the time that God has willed. And so may you and I receive the word of God, and may that become the appointed time of God. Second, a new era or new time of redemptive history opened up as a result of the word being given in that generation. The creation of Adam through the word, the time of the beginning was set. When God gave the law at Mount Sinai, it was the time of the law, time of the Old Testament law. When Jesus came, the word became flesh, it was the time of the church began. 
a new era of the church, of Christianity. And in the end, when the little book is given, time of the final judgment. And third, the new age or new era and time opened up through the people who received the word. And I pray that you and I may become the people that will receive this word. Because in Revelation, John, who becomes the two witnesses by receiving the little book, eating the book and digesting the book, the Lord says to him, you shall prophesy again. He is preaching again. The, sharing the word. And that represents the work of the church of the end time. May you and I be the ones that will receive this word, the word being given to us from heaven. And through the people that receive this word, God begins his work. God begins his, God be, opens up the new era, new age. Not the new age as in the new age in, in the United States, but the new era, new time, which is the end time. They became the center through whom God unraveled his work of redemption. May you and I, and may our churches, and our, the church together, become the center through which God does his work and proclaims his word in this end time. And may we be able to see that eternal day when we will dwell with God eternally and enjoy that eternal and final atonement. Let us pray. Our Heavenly Father, we give thanks to you for giving us this time to think about how Genesis genealogies and the, the beginning creation account speaks about Jesus and the end time. And how, God, you appointed your times so that we can understand where we are spiritually. Individually, in what stage we are. And according to this history of redemption, what we need to do. And Father, allow us to receive that rain and that dew. The spiritual rain, which is your word. And may that word bear fruit in us, in our churches. And may we become the church. May we become the people through whom you will begin your new work in this end time, that you will gather your harvest, and that you will be glorified. Thank you so much for your grace. And we ask all these things in the precious and holy name of our Lord Jesus Christ with thanksgiving. Amen. Let us give thanks to God.